Welcome to episode 230. Dude, 230 episodes of Friars on the Farm. I'm Donovan, and with me is Roy. Oh, I'm looking forward to talking to an old friend. Old friend, who we actually talked to in, in, in separately at the game uh, this last season at Petco. Yeah, John Nolan is coming on with us today, uh, and we've had an opportunity to have our paths crossed several times between winter meetings and spring training and all this other stuff. Uh, and we've talked to him a couple of times, what, at least two or three times on the podcast here over the last yeah. five years. Um, always an entertaining chat. So looking forward to talking with him here. Absolutely. But before we do that, let's do a little housekeeping. Please go on Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio and hit the subscribe button. Give us a review on Apple. Also follow us on X, Instagram, Threads. Uh, we're now on YouTube. Uh, search Friars on the Farm on YouTube. Smash the subscribe button, please. It helps us out a lot. We'll be posting videos, interviews. We'll be posting this interview. Uh, and in the following season, you know, in the upcoming season, any interviews that I do up in Lake Elsinore, uh, any uh, any games that I go to and I collect video, uh, I'll be posting it on the YouTube channel. Also, we have new cool opening music. That is Thrills by Vito and the Trees. Uh, they're a local band. They're really fun. Uh, if you want to catch them on Spotify, search them on Spotify. If you want to catch them live, you can see them February 23rd at the Template in Ocean Beach. But right now, let's kick it to John Nolan. Well, hey, we're joined here by old friend of the podcast. And John, I think you're actually the most... You're the guest with the most appearances. Um, John Nolan, he's the media relations and voice of the Tin Caps. Welcome back to the show. Thank you so much. It's an absolute honor to be a recurring guest now. Uh, although, Donovan, I am having some nostalgia for the last time you and I had sat down yeah. uh, in person for a podcast episode. It was on the waterfront, uh, yeah. not too far from Petco. At uh, down in downtown San Diego, and I know, unfortunately, as we talk and record this, it's uh, pretty severely rainy um, weather, leading to some flooding by you guys. And then uh, I'm out here in Fort Wayne, where last week we had sub-zero temperatures, snow. <laughs> all of a sudden, uh, a bit of an ice storm uh, here this week. So, uh, yeah, glad at least we can talk about baseball and look ahead to uh, to that beautiful weather come spring and summer. Yeah, and think dry thoughts. <laughs> Amen. Well, speaking of the weather, you guys had a bit of a late winter this year. I usually you guys rim the infield with the Christmas lights. And I always like that shot when the snow falls and those lights glow up through it. But we never saw that this winter. Yeah, that is picturesque. And, and uh, you know, I, I know one thing we were going to talk about here, guys, just looking ahead to 2024 changes at Parkview Field, which uh, we'll be celebrating its 15th anniversary, believe it or not, even though it still maintained uh, it still maintains its ranking as the top ballpark, regardless of level, you know, high A all the way up through uh, through triple A down to single A. Uh, major change for next year will be that we have a brand new playing surface. The uh, the sod was replaced during the off season, and so we nice. didn't light up the field uh, this Christmas time just to spare it. Um, as that new saw the grounds crew and you know, outside uh, workers put in a lot of lot a lot a lot of hours to uh, to have it looking just about perfect and so uh, we'll probably have it lit up uh, again next year but uh, a little bit of a different off season for the field this year. Oh yeah, well to skip ahead to that since you brought it up, what was the is the the field always looked good to me as a fan yeah. watching on TV and everything. What what was the reason? What's the change? What's different? Yeah, no doubt. And so our head groundskeeper, Keith Winter, and uh, his right-hand guys, Jake Sperry and Bryce Kinder, they could definitely give a better explanation on this than me. But in short, one of the changes with Major League Baseball now overseeing the operations of Minor League Baseball is that there, is, there are a whole bunch of different standards that need to be met. So that includes, you know, things like having additional locker room space for females uh, here at Parkview Field. The previous offseason, we expanded the size of the weight room. Just another example of that would be uh, specifications for the field. So certainly, uh, if you're out here at the ballpark as a fan or you're watching on MILB.TV or what have you, yeah, it looked immaculate. And again, the playing surface itself has been awarded tops in all of professional baseball year after year for the Midwest League. Um, but there was a, a crown, so to speak, from the infield down towards the dugouts down towards the outfield that was designed that way 15 or so years ago 
uh, for drainage purposes, but the uh, crown that was graded to be too steep. So uh, mm -hmm. as a result, had to uh, re-level the field, basically. And so then uh, on top of that, the sod was replaced. So yeah, it was a project that took weeks, months, uh, really began, well, planning began months and months ago, because um, again, we're fortunate to have arguably the best grounds crew in all of uh, professional baseball and, and Keith Winters, just uh, incredible. So, um, but yeah, as soon as the season ended, that project was implemented and yeah, thankfully the snow, you know, there's probably been some years where there might've been snow on, uh, on Halloween. Thankfully that wasn't the case this year. And by, um, by November, pretty much they got things set and now it'll be ready for the 2024 season. So, you so said less crowd that, that means more, uh, more bunts will stay fair. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. Uh, exactly. We'll see how it, it uh, factors in. I know, um, you know, one thing we've heard in the last couple of years with guys coming up from Lake Elsinore to here, instead of in the old days, it was in reverse. Those guys in Lake Elsinore, you know, with that, uh, the climate there, I think guys were benefiting from the really short grass. Uh, and they're saying, you know, if they got it on the ground, it was kind of on a speed path into the outfield, sometimes we're here. I, I don't think it's necessarily a high grass that was really slowing things down, but by comparison to uh, to the diamond, a little bit different because yeah, just the literally the climate's quite quite different from uh, out west to here. Yeah, the infields are a little a little fast out here in the Cali League. So th so this year, John, you guys had you had a couple of different voices in the in the in the booth this year. Was that by design or was something going on? Because I heard several different co-hosts um on the broadcast yeah you know out of all 120 teams in minor league baseball these days i believe we're one of only two that have two different broadcasts uh for each home game at parkview field one for radio one for for a long time we were on local tv throughout the state of indiana as of last year with the implementation of the bally live app as a free feature for fans to tune in from from all over uh, that limited our ability to be on local TV just due to the contractual broadcasting rights, again, overseen by MLB. Um, so, yeah, at times last year, um, I was joined by Derek Decker. He was he was my wingman uh, for games on the road, on the radio, too. And then uh, we've had a, a rotation of analysts over the years. We've had a few different former minor league, even major league baseball players who uh, grew up here or now live in the Fort Wayne area join me. So that's included uh, Justin Leiby, who had been in the Phillies system. Uh, and then Brett Rump, he's our, our local sports guy on, on the yeah. local sports station on the radio that the Tin Caps are on 1380 The Fan. He hosts an afternoon drive show there. And he's actually a former college uh, pitcher himself. So uh, Brett would be in the booth with me at times too. Tracy Kaufman, even a local uh, yeah. division one softball coach. Uh, Tracy joined me when her schedule allowed. So yeah, you know, we got uh, what 66 home games uh, and needless to say, it's not, uh, not really practical for somebody like on the Padre side, you know, for mud, it's his job to basically be there for all 162. Occasionally, you know, Sweeney or Tony will, uh, will fill in. Here we got to kind of balance everyone's schedules, including my own. I, I should point out, you know, I, I missed, uh, <laughs> missed this game here or there last year. Um, so did not get that certificate out at the end of the season for perfect attendance. Ah, well, So you got Mike Moss on the radio too. It seems like he's, he's been there for what, a couple of decades now, right? Yeah. Mike Moss has been an institution here on the local radio broadcast for home games. And uh, yeah, he certainly, he predates the tin caps going back to the, uh, the old Fort Wayne wizards era. Well, I want to give a shout out to your production folks. Um, you guys have some of the best production quality in minor league yeah. baseball, and I'm sure it rivals some of the, some of the major league uh, crews with the information you guys put up on the screen and, you know, all the different camera angles that you have. So shout out to those guys that Absolutely. don't get to get in front of a microphone or a camera. Yeah. Thank you so much for saying that. So Melissa Herrings, our director of video production and Jared law, our assistant uh, director for video production. And yeah, I'd like to, you know, I probably bring bring down the overall grade of the broadcast uh, on air <laughs> in terms of the uh, the nuts and bolts of the production, and then so many different guys and girls uh, on the crew running the cameras and the positions in the control room. Last year, we had Jake Ulrey and Nolan Bullman as uh, interns, but they were putting in full time hours to uh, to make our broadcast look 
um, and, and sound like they did uh, in the 2023 season. So, uh, yeah, pre- I appreciate you uh, acknowledging that because, yeah, it's, it's a point of pride. And again, yeah. you know, here with the Tin Caps, it starts with uh, our ownership group, Hardball Capital, led by Jason Fryer and, you know, the resources that he's able to provide our staff with. And I think a lot of people are familiar with Mike Nutter. Uh, he's the reigning minor league baseball executive of the year as our team president. And you know, our broadcast is overseen by our vice president of marketing, Michael Limmer. And, you know, I think we have 34 full-time staff members here, uh, you know, highlighted the grounds crew video production. And yeah, just fortunate to have a lot of people who are uh, to use a, a cliche, <laughs> uh, you know, pulling the rope in the same direction. Everyone's just striving to, to give our fans here in Fort Wayne a first um uh, first in class experience. And then, yeah, glad we're able to have that translate to some degree, at least uh, over the, uh, over the stream with the broadcast. And it was cool last year to have a number of games picked up on the MLB app. Um, and I guess you could see every game on the MLB app uh, yeah. live. We were kind of the featured game of the day, a half dozen times or so. Um, so yeah, kudos to, uh, to everyone there who, who works really hard to, uh, to do that. And just a quick note too, as an aside, going inside baseball here, so to speak. Let's say you're enjoying a game at Petco. Uh, you, you might not be aware of this, but there's you know two distinct, at least two, sometimes three, camera crews working where you'd have the crew that's part of the uh, in-ballpark entertainment that you're seeing on the big screens at Petco. Then there's, well, what would have been the uh, Bally Sports San Diego crew now, the MLB-produced Padres broadcast and then maybe the uh, road teams uh, might have some of their own cameras uh, being operated for their TV broadcasts also well here the crew they're working double duty because when the game action is live they have the camera shots following batter pitcher everything else going on and then you know that third out is recorded there's no chance to rest because now uh, you know they're seeking out fans for the dance cam and uh the different on-field promotions <laughs> on the field. So they got to be locked in for the full you know, two and a half, three hours uh, plus. Actually here in Fort Wayne too, where we uh, let fans run the bases after every single game. You know, they're, they're even logging time after the last out. The fireworks are recorded as they get a uh, video of fans uh, running around the bases. Well, you know, and, and I don't want to, uh, you know, I don't want to cut short on the culinary side of, of uh, Parkview Field, but you guys were nominated uh, for the best alternate identity, and you had one of the alternate identity was the uh, was the fried tenderloin. Did you guys sell that as well as wear the uniforms? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So the tenderloin is uh, the unofficial state sandwich here in Indiana. There, there actually was legislation that was in uh, motion last year to uh, make it official. Uh, didn't pa- didn't pass, but. Uh, no politics, no yeah. political talk here. Um, but yeah, sure enough, not only did we have those uh, special red, white, and blue uh, jerseys, they were designed by our creative director, uh, Tony Displains. They had really amazing detail. Every single county throughout the state of Indiana uh, was written uh, subtly on the jersey. And uh, there was just oh. a, a state fair kind of uh, motif that extended around the ballpark. So there were the state fairground kind of games out in the outfield concourse and yeah sure enough special order on the menu tenderloin sandwiches our our director of food and beverage bill lane who uh, again you know and uh uh, our uh, head chef uh paisan and michael scheidler a bunch of people behind the scenes there uh they made special accommodations to uh to get i don't know a thousand tenderloins there over the course of four games well Wow. Now they were pretty diligent in their planning. Sure enough, that first night by the uh, seventh inning, we were already uh, nearly sold out. So they had to put in an emergency <laughs> order because, uh, yeah, the fans love them. Some tenderloin sandwiches. I think we uh, we won that. Fittingly, we won like 10 nothing, 10 runs on tenderloin yeah. night. Um, that, uh-huh. that first game. So Mike Nutter, he grabbed uh, whatever was remaining, though. He brought him down to the clubhouse. I know oh, Ethan nice. Routson, at least one of our relievers. Uh, he, he dove into the post game spread at tenderloins. I'm sure uh, others did as well, but uh, yeah, that was a fun time. And yeah, cool to see how, um, like you said, that was a finalist for best alternate identity around minor league baseball. And so those jerseys and that theme got some uh, shine on MLB network. Yeah. You guys might want to consider having a, a permanent tenderloin stand somewhere yeah. around the ballpark. 
and the yeah uh, the uniforms i i I don't, I don't mean this in a bad way. They reminded me of the hot dog on a stick. Yeah. You know, hot dog on a stick at the, at the, I don't know if they have it back in Fort Wayne, but out here, that's like an institution at the, at the, the San Diego County fair with, um, with the, with the big stripes and the hats. Yeah. Yeah. Man, that's yeah, a lot I, of fun. I know what you're saying. And yeah, actually I've seen other ballparks in the Midwest have tenderloins, uh, on sale every game. I think it, you know, to be honest at Parkview field, uh, pre pandemic times, uh, for supply chain uh, issues, uh, kind of threw some things out of whack. We used to have them here uh, all the time as well. But now it's kind of fun that it's uh, something we're bringing back here again this season for a weekend. So, uh, yeah, as long as, you know, everyone can have some patience, uh, they'll, uh, they'll get their fill at least for a weekend here. So I'll, you know, I'll even continue with, uh, with just shining on Parkview and the Tin Caps and, and their whole crew there. You guys are so much more than just a, a baseball team and a community partner. partner. You know, the Tin Caps are really a, a community leader, I, I, I feel. Can you talk about some of the, some of the uh, events and projects you guys had happen this, uh, this season? Yeah, and like I said, this will be the 15th anniversary for the Tin Caps in 2024. So, you know, as uh, everyone can see who's tuned in uh, for the YouTube audience and clips here on social media, you know, Roy uh, has a great uh, background with uh, the downtown skyline feature just outside the ballpark gates. You can kind of see it behind uh, me here as well from Parkview Field. Uh, so, yeah, you know, the, the team is just in the heart of the city and so – Credit to the amazing support that the fans have provided here in Northeast Indiana, even into bordering states uh, coming out here year after year and in, in droves. And so, yeah, the team in turn, you know, tries to be a community partner. So I mentioned there are 66 home games for uh, the high A level in minor league baseball. But out of the 365, or I guess we're a leap year here, 366 uh, on the calendar, you know, there's something happened at the ballpark darn close to like 360 yeah. of those days um so you know a couple that uh that come to mind right after the shortly after the season ends late september fort for fitness it's an annual uh running festival where the finish line of whether it's uh there's different races that include a half marathon a four mile run 10k but regardless of what race you're in finish line is home plate so it's really wow. cool for fans to get a chance to do a lap uh their final lap uh, in their race around the uh, warning track and cross home. Uh, there was a big downtown wide events on Thanksgiving Eve called night of lights. And so the different big buildings here downtown have their own light displays and kind of one by one uh, they're lit up. And then that night culminates with a, a fireworks show here presented by pizza. Hut. So those the ball are state, the ball, the ball state, um, kind of conference there with the with the students there what was that about yeah we just had a uh, ball state university had a sports business class uh, up here at the ballpark a week before we uh were recording here and that's a partnership that has been going on for uh, as long as the tin caps have been around where our ticket sales staff um they visit ball state's campuses uh, roughly an hour away from uh fort wayne in muncie indiana um and so our ticket sales staff, they'll make some field trips down there to visit with the students and pass along their knowledge of what they do here with the tin caps for those who are aspiring to get a foot in the door working in professional baseball. And uh, then those students actually, um, you know, they uh, they get some real life, real world working experience where uh, they get on the phone and call some of our fans who previously bought tickets uh, and you know see if they're interested in coming back to the ballpark uh, for this coming season. So um, yeah, that's a, another way that we stay involved and, um, yeah, let's goes on you every Monday, the, uh, rotary club here in Fort Wayne, they have their meeting, uh, in one of the ballpark special event spaces. A couple other groups are here on a weekly basis for business conferences, not to mention, you know, we have weddings here, Holly Rainey and, uh, Lexi, uh, Smith, whose last name just changed because she got married here at the ballpark. So what better Testament, uh, can we have to the quality of the special events crew here than that someone who works here and actually several people who work here have had their weddings at the ballpark. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, more than baseball is the tagline that we have here um, from again, big time events like last year, Bert Kreischer had a comedy festival yeah. out on the field, but uh, you know, we've had proms uh, in the, the events, Lincoln financial event center 
uh, yeah, whole vast variety of, uh, of things here that, that make Parkview feel kind of the, the hub of the community. All right. Well, you said more than baseball, but I mean, ultimately we're here to talk about baseball. Uh, we want to take a look back at last year um, and run through some players that came through Fort Wayne. Uh, Victor Lizarraga is somebody that we've been following for a while. He's still very young, um, even though it seems like he's been in the org forever. Um, but he was with you last year. He had a bit of a mixed season. Um, did you see him take a bit of a step forward at some point? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. It was really awesome to see Liz's progress over the course of the season. I think as uh, the year wrapped up, I heard coaches say they thought they might've seen the most growth uh, out of anyone from him. And uh, that was probably a good thing in a yeah. weird sense, maybe that he struggled in at, at some points in the first half of the season. And again, this is all with the context of the fact that he was 18 years old and was the youngest pitcher uh, in the league last year for most of the season, even at times the youngest player in the league overall. And so uh, for Liz, it was, you know, some growing pains, but he figured things out. And he, he came to learn that, you know, he maybe needed to uh, put in some extra work in between starts when it comes to, you know, preparation for his outing or, uh, extra time in the weight room, but I know, yeah, he really earned the trust and respect of everyone in the clubhouse. And then all of a sudden, you know, he pitched like uh, he shoved in the biggest games of the season, yeah. closed out the uh, regular season home schedule, like six shutout innings, then did the same on the last day of the regular season on the road in a must win or uh, not necessarily a must win game, but a game that uh, uh, had postseason implications. Yeah. So he, I think he won the uh, Midwest League pitcher of the week award twice over the, the last few weeks of the season. Um, so, yeah, excited to see now that he kind of learned the, some of those uh, lessons here in um, in Fort Wayne, uh, how he'll be set up going forward. But, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely encouraged by uh, the maturity that he showed uh, as that season went along. Absolutely. And uh, so back at Parkview Field this last season, it's Carter Lowen uh, returning from Tommy John's surgery, uh, just blowing the doors off the competition again. He uh, he seemed to be back to form this year. Yeah, from the surgery. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think again, it's uh, a guy who, as you touched on there, coming off Tommy John surgery, uh, that in itself is uh, a major obstacle and something that I think, as baseball fans now, we are taking for granted a little bit because it is yeah. incredible, amazing. The uh, you know, thanks to uh, the technology of medicine and, and rehabilitation that so many guys are able to overcome it. But it's one of those cases where certainly, you know, progress there's not going to be linear and not to mention just the way baseball works. And, you know, some of his early outings when he came up from Lake Eda here, uh, you know, there was like a, a ball that was dropped in the outfield that was scored as an extra base hit rather than an error that kind of messed up his ERA and that something similar to that happened uh, multiple times for him early on. But uh, yeah, Carter is a great leader uh, for this team too. And yeah, not to mention though, uh, he showed that he can throw a fastball in the upper nineties, maybe better yet. He showed that he doesn't have to be relying on that uh, at really solid secondary stuff. And it was a, a well-earned call up for him to, uh, to San Antonio there at the end of the year. Yeah. So Adam Mazur was the de facto ace of the staff this season. Did did he ever hit a rough patch at all? Didn't sure didn't sure seem like it. Yeah, no, and uh, Adam was uh, was remarkable in his his pro debut because after he'd been drafted in the second round out of Iowa last year, due to all the innings that he threw as he was the Big Ten pitcher of the year, he didn't have any official game action. Um, but that title of ace, which, yeah, again, I think as fans, you know, it's fun for us to, to throw around good, good situation for the tin caps last year was that it just seemed like whoever had the ball was an ace. Cause I mean, Jairo Iriarte, who's now on the 40 man roster. Uh, he clearly pitched like an ace Ryan Berger uh, at times had the best numbers on the staff, but yeah, specifically with Adam. Yeah. I think um, the way that he operates, it's just so smooth and fluid that he kind of makes it makes it look easy. He was putting up video game numbers uh, during his time uh, with the tin caps and yeah, mid season was uh, rightfully called up to, uh, to the missions there at the double a level. But uh, yeah, Adam, it's crazy. Cause I think he still can project to improve 
kind of a, a wiry frame, sort of a late bloomer there coming originally grew up in Minnesota, then pitching at Iowa and just like has burst onto the scene here in the last couple of years. And uh, they, a little bit added strength. He's already throwing mid to high nineties, uh, pretty nasty, uh, nasty breaking pitch. So yeah, part of this group, right. As Pod- you know, Padres fans right now are, are looking to, uh, to the future, not to say that there isn't a lot to be excited about with what's going to be on the opening day roster here for 2024, but sort of that, that long-term vision here is that the farm system, as you guys well cover, you know, really, um, again, was replenished over the course of the last couple of years. And, you know, Adam's a guy who, uh, yeah, knock on wood, could be in the mix for a rotation spot uh, not too far from now. Absolutely. We'll talk about another ace as the ace of the organization where he made stops all throughout. Like, I don't know why he didn't stop it. I don't know why he didn't, you know, make a start in triple a, but Robbie Snelling made a, a quick stop. There with seven starts. Um, pretty stingy with runs. Uh, what did you think of Robbie? Cause we've asked everyone. Yeah. And uh, you know, I would just like to say that for Padres fans credit to the, uh, the entire organization, but specifically those um, in player development and for that matter, in scouting, initially bringing guys into this organization and franchise. Uh, it's, it's really amazing the quality of people that they're they're bringing in. I mean, we're going to talk about the talent that they have, too. But uh, I say this earnestly as a broadcaster. I'd probably try to put a positive spin on everybody uh, regardless, but these guys make it easy. I don't really need to put any spin on it because they're just genuinely really good people. I know you've had a chance to talk to Robbie and think uh, someone on the coaching staff described it last year that he was when he was 18, 19 going on 37. I mean, just really uh, <laughs> poised beyond his years. Um I mean, one thing that's probably going to stick with me for a long time is that when he made his Parkview field debut through something like five and two thirds innings without giving up a run. And then finally, before that last out in the six, he gave up one, maybe it was two runs. In any case, it was a type of type of performance that everyone, and it was a sellout crowd, like 8,000 people, everyone came away, just wowed. And there was Robbie after the game, um, apologizing for the fact that he right. gave up a run or two like and like he was really sincere um about that and you know was really determined to be better next time out and then i you know i think he did throw like six shutout innings with a bunch of strikeouts in that next performance so just uh a really tremendous person i think um you kind of it's hard to even put a ceiling on on someone like that when they're so self-driven and, you know, they're just going to do everything right off the field. And then, uh, of course, you know, obvious storyline with Robbie, too, is that it's pretty tantalizing to think about what his ceiling can be now that he's really just locked in on baseball after it was only a couple years ago that he was getting offered by every uh, Power 5 college football program to be a linebacker. So, yeah, it's really, really exciting to think about uh, what he's going to be able to continue to unlock here in coming years. Well, another guy that we got to speak to recently was Austin Krobe. Um, He had a pretty good year with you guys as well. Lefty, who doesn't quite throw as hard as Robbie Snelling does, uh, but his pitchability, he he seemed to be able to attack hitters at an advanced level. Yeah, and, and you know, first word that comes to mind um, there with Austin probably is competitor. And, uh, again, I think all these guys obviously – prove that they compete at a really high level but um regardless of role i mean towards the uh the end of the season uh, in the playoffs he was asked to come out of the bullpen and uh you know he pitched his butt off and given the 10 caps a chance to to nearly upset the uh, top seed in the midwest league playoffs in a long relief outing and uh, i think he's one of those guys actually who's so fiery so competitive maybe we saw some uh, development from him over the course of the season of like how to harness that the right way. Maybe at times he was a guy who, again, was uh, going to be too hard on himself with uh, expectations for uh, perfection. And as you know, these guys rise up through the system, the higher you are, obviously at all the talent and competitiveness on the other side, you know, exists too. But, um, but for Austin, yeah, he was a guy who, again, has kind of come from some uh, humbler beginnings uh, in terms of baseball, uh, 
as growing up in Iowa, going the junior college route at first before he uh, broke through at, at TCU. And I just mean compared to somebody who maybe grew up in South Florida or Southern California and was like immediately on the big time uh, prospect circuit as a young teenager. Uh, yeah. I love how Austin's earned, earned his opportunities and uh yeah, they're not going to find too many lefties who are, who can still throw uh, up into the mid-90s like he can with the, the secondary stuff. So, um, yeah, again, a guy who's probably not even necessarily on the top 10 or top uh, 15 in a lot of the prospect ranking lists out there. But uh, with his um, experience going through college now into his early 20s, maybe a guy who could contribute uh, in a relief role here, again, not too yeah. not too far away. Yeah, a lot of the a lot of the times, uh, you know, pitchers will come up and start in the bullpen and then work their way into the rotation. But let's talk about uh, let's just get it right out of the way. Uh, Ethan Salas spent a little bit of time in Fort Wayne as well. Um, not as long as we were expecting, not as long as we had hoped, but certainly spent uh, a little bit of time there. What did you think about the young phenom? Yeah, I mean, just uh, kind of uh, insane how at the age of, of seventeen just, you know, unfazed by, um, by being at the high A level while everyone else who's 17 in, in Fort Wayne or anywhere in the United States, you know, they're gearing up for senior year, a high school and, and whatnot. And, uh, yeah, someone who's clearly earned the respect of, uh, of his teammates and, you know, just doesn't really come in with, um, uh, with anything, but an attitude of that he's here to work and that, you know, Obviously, I think he's probably going to draw some comparisons um, to Fernando as far as a guy who's on the map as a top prospect, not just for the Padres, but a top prospect in all of Major League Baseball, you know, being featured on social media by the MLB accounts, for example. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, Ethan, he has high, high expectations for himself, too. And so he's not going to be overly impressed with what he's able to to do whether that's uh you know debuting out in lake elsinore at 16 and rising up to uh to double a san antonio i think uh and he's uh again just really poised i know he's described as an old soul i would yeah wish you could have gotten to know his personality a little bit more but uh i appreciate the time that we uh, did have with him this past season yeah i'd like to think that you're going to get another look at him i i don't <laughs> know <laughs> I mean, they could do anything with him. They, they, right. It seems like the sky's the limit, but it makes sense to me to start him off next year in Fort Wayne. Um, so let's move on to the next guy. So Nathan Martorella, uh, he put on an absolute laser show out there. Did he have to pay for any damages that he'd made to the ballpark? Yeah, well, per- perhaps because whatever numbers uh, Nate put up this year, it certainly feels like he probably could have had at least a half dozen more home runs. It's a little bit of a higher wall in right field. So for him as a left-handed power bat, um, he was victim of the higher wall there because otherwise he was, he was denting the, the upper tier of that wall. Um, yeah. Rem- just a phenomenal season. A guy who posted in terms of playing every single day, you know, him, him and Jacob Marcy in tandem, uh, we're leading all of minor league baseball in games played over the course of their time with the tin caps. And, uh, yeah, I love the, the fire that the passion that, uh, that Nathan brought here to the team, another leader, uh, in the clubhouse, uh, you know, leader on a team too, that, uh, you know, that one here in Fort Wayne made the playoffs. Uh, he had, he put them in position to do that before he was called up to a double a San Antonio. Um, but yeah, just, uh, kind of the, Again, a guy putting that bucket there of ultimate, ultimate competitor, just a total gamer. Yeah, we we were impressed when we talked to him just by how driven he was. Like he wasn't talking about like if I make it, he's like he's got it in his mind that I am a major leaguer. I I will be there. Uh, did he actually hit a ball out of the ballpark? It was a foul ball, but I think he hit one all the way to the street. Yeah, I'm sure he I'm sure he did because yeah, there is a, a street down the right field corner. Uh, where a guy like him, yeah, can can poke one out. And it's one where if all of a sudden it starts rolling down the street too, I don't know where the tape measure uh, marking stops, but, you know, probably <laughs> when you count when you count the roll towards the sidewalk, like in the old uh, Sandlot days, that's like, you know, five with the roll, you know, 500 plus. You know, you I've know, I- always, it's the thing, Mickey Mantle has that home run that they say went 640 some feet. It's like, 
come on after how many well, bounces and it fell on the back of a of a cement truck and right. here in fort wayne where there's a really rich baseball history that not everyone's aware of first professional baseball league game was played here not New York, not Boston, Philly, Chicago. It was here in Fort Wayne, the National Association, 1871. But, uh, yeah, then back in the 1920s, Babe Ruth, when he was on a barnstorming tour, he made some appearances here. The Yankees played an exhibition game here. And uh, on the list of longest home runs ever, <laughs> they include a home run that, that Ruth hit here that landed in the back car of a train so right. yeah they gave it some some added carry as it uh as it rolled away, as it uh rumbled away <laughs> made its way all the way across the country yeah. so he set the record straight nathan martorella we know him as a first baseman but he spent a lot of time in left field how did you look out there yeah certainly you know held, held his own um yeah i think it's all about versatility these days and so uh, first base would be his primary position. And yeah, he wasn't making Tatis S catches um, diving for balls towards uh, towards the left center field necessarily, but El I don't have the numbers in front of me, but yeah, I, I, honest, I can't think of an error that he made in left field. Uh, it was really, really clean there. And especially again, when you factor in just all the games that he logged last year, um, admirable that he was just willing to stay in the lineup wherever uh, the, the team needed him and again just add into uh to his capabilities all right so speaking of slugging first baseman my one of my favorite stories early on this year was griffin dorshing going back there and i didn't realize that in his college days he made a visit to to fort wayne and he hit hit one of the windows out there in that hotel over your right shoulder yeah, no, he, this is not exaggerating. When he was at Northern Kentucky, and he'd then be a grad transfer at Oklahoma State, but at Northern Kentucky 2021, and that was actually the first game the ballpark uh, hosted here following our lost season because of the pandemic. They were playing Purdue-Fort Wayne, and he literally dented the building um, out in uh, left field, the Harrison that we call it. Um, left a mark, yeah, it's still, still not necessarily repaired as he uh, dinged the building. And then this year he's, he hit one to the uh, second level of the building off the windows during a game. I mean, his batting practice was probably the most incredible that I've, that I've ever seen. Um, and again, that's considering that we once had uh toddy here and, and some yeah. other major sluggers. I mean, Joshua Mears this year is another one who could put on a show, but uh, yeah, Griffin, I think you guys got a sense, uh, terrific personality really engaging but i had him there for the uh the stretch run of the season but uh a guy who yes literally left his mark here <laughs> well talk about a, a guy that's uh, leaving his mark in the organization you know jackson merrill uh i'm, I'm wearing the merrill madness shirt thank you jenny merrill um he really did come into his own this year like we saw him last year in in uh in in lake elsinore um but this year it just seemed like he really embraced the role as a leader. Did the, did the team embrace him as a leader and how did he go? Yeah. Well, just at first, uh, well, as you credit his, uh, his mom there for the sure. Yeah. Wonderful family. It was really cool to have them out here at a Parkview field. They were able to see some games on the road too. Um, yeah, probably the best way to describe, you know, just how all in as a teammate Jackson is, would uh, technically be post Tin Cap's career because he was out in the Futures game in July, and then it would turn out to be after his appearance in the Futures game, he got the promotion to AA San Antonio. But um, as he was flying from the Futures game back east, we had a game that he, unfortunately, just due to the scheduling, he had to miss, but he was watching the game on the plane and he was sending us messages because uh, that was a game in which the Tin Caps uh, had multiple comebacks. And so he was saying that you know, he woke up the guy next to him on the plane who was sleeping because he was just so fired up. Uh, yeah, I think, again, just uh, sort of the overall culture that I witnessed here, especially this past season, is that guys are, are really there for each other. Um, and I guess I just don't really want to take away like from Jackson's leadership abilities and makeup, but I would say that, and maybe this is an, a, an example of how he is a leader. It's not like he was an alpha um, just on this team because 
you know, truth be told, you had guys like Nathan Martorella, Marcos Castagnon, Jacob Marcy. I mean, I could name a bunch of others who uh, I think really were just as much the heart of the team. So just uh, in fairness to everyone, I, I don't think it would be accurate to describe Jackson as doing something, you know, uh, like putting a cape on and running, running stuff. Yeah. I think though that for a guy who's a top prospect, yeah, it's great that he seamlessly fits in though. Um, no kind of uh, attitude in which he'd be, you know, standoffish, just true, true, great teammate fits in uh, with everyone. And um, unfortunately had a slow start to the season, even for someone who grew up in uh, the mid Atlantic in oh, Maryland. Right. I mean, when, <laughs> when it's 30, 40 degrees in those April games, it's regardless of if you have experience hitting in it before it's, it's not fun. It's not easy to put up numbers. I think back, some of the guys who've come through here over the years, I mean, Ty France has basically hit 300 every uh, stop along the way, including in the big leagues, except in Fort Wayne, because yeah, April kind of <laughs> threw the numbers off, but, and then not to mention Jackson had a couple of uh, bouts of being under the weather, uh, having yeah. like the flu that uh, slowed things down. But yeah, once he, once he got into a groove early part of May, you know, he was, really really elite at just putting the ball in play frankly and that was even more uh, outstanding considering that he was one of the youngest guys here uh, at the high a level this past year um but yeah not not only an act to put uh, the bat on the ball but to barrel it and uh consistently hit line drives and get on base and you know, his ability at shortstop is probably underrated um because like the hit tool gets talked about more but uh really really strong defensively at short and uh yeah just one of the other fun fun prospects we've been able to uh to pull for here at parkview fields yeah you mentioned that flu i forgot about that there was yeah. uh some illness that swept through your whole clubhouse what was that in april early may there were, you know it, it's kind of crazy going going back here recent years 2021 that first season out of the pandemic we made it through that year somehow without any players contracting covid <laughs> and missing time and then wouldn't you know now the last then there was a small number of guys who dealt with covid during our 2022 season then this past year and it wasn't always covid but uh we had once a month first few months of the season there was a situation where guys were having to hit the shelf um being sick so yeah it was <laughs> kind of threw a wrench uh wrench in the start of the season for this group but uh thankfully everyone was able to uh you know, not be down for too long. Well, you guys had a whole stream of guys coming through, uh, through your park this year. Uh, Graham Pauly started off like a rocket in Lake Elsinore, but then once he showed up in Parkview field, all of a sudden the power showed up. He had 16 home runs for you guys, uh, in his 45 games there uh, with Fort Wayne. Uh, what could you tell us about what you saw out of Graham? Yeah. I remember as a kid, there was, uh, a book, um, you know, kind of like an early chapter book introduction to uh to reading for kids and the title of the book was uh the, the kid only hits homers <laughs> and that was basically basically uh the story of grand Pauly this past year <laughs> kidding though because he did a lot more than just hit home runs um yeah he was unreal hottest hitter really in all of baseball at any level i was you know at one point in time just going through uh through the numbers and he was in the same sentence as Otani for what he was what he was accomplishing uh, during his time as a tin cap, amazingly down to earth guy. Yeah. Uh, and you know, just can, kind of can harping on that theme uh, of the guys that we had come through here in Fort Wayne. Kind of like, oh shucks, um, yeah. Just Graham Graham was a blast to cover for uh, the month or, or two that we had him. You know, and one of his best friends now on the team, uh, you'd mentioned earlier, Jacob Marcy. He talked about several of the coaches there helping him with his swing, helping him with his uh with 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 stealing bags. Um, did you see changes from him as the season went on? Because he seemed to get better as the season went on. Yeah, definitely. Uh yeah. Jacob was uh and you know, continuing on after his time in, in Fort Wayne, San Antonio, then the fall league. I mean, he was arguably the uh the top success story uh from this past year i mean graham won the organizational player of the year award and then jacob got that arizona fall league mvp but 
Yeah, I think, uh, you know, just one example of the development that Jacob showed over the course of the season, he didn't necessarily have uh, the, the power um, on display in the first month or two of the season. I know working with uh, the coaching staff, some adjustments uh, to his swing, and all of a sudden, you know, if a pitcher made a mistake on the inner inner part of the plate, it was gone. And then even towards uh, the tail end of his run with the tin caps, uh, showed some opposite field power over the wall too. Um, but yeah, just uh, again now, don't mean to be repeating myself, but you know, appreciate the background for a guy like him. Multi-sport athlete in high school in Michigan, and then uh, you know wasn't heavily recruited necessarily. In part, dealt with uh, significant injury during high school that uh, threw off the recruitment process. But uh, at Central Michigan, he balled out and uh, earned his earned his opportunity with the Padres. And you know he's done nothing nothing but post uh, again so far since he was drafted. And uh, Again, up there with uh, Jackson Merrill's family, it was cool to have uh, Jacob's family since they were only a couple hours away yeah. from Parkview Field and even closer with a few of the teams in our division being up in Michigan uh, frequently, being there to uh, to support him in person. Uh, definitely a major highlight of the season. Another really awesome kind of guy too, like both both him and Paula, just like I, yeah. just easy to talk to, no pretension, no like – I was just like, hey, you know, we, we talked to him uh, a couple of weeks back. Uh, like, we could have talked to that kid for an hour and a half, but we're like, okay, we gotta we gotta kind of wrap it up. Um, that that does say a lot about how scouting has has gone above just being the player. Sure, you could pick the absolute best player uh, in the draft, but the really looking at the background, doing the. Um, doing the due diligence and the makeup of the player, I think goes a long way. We're not only just getting along with teammates, but being coachable and the coachability of players and, and the, um, and the ability to fail and be okay with it. Like I noticed a lot of talking to those three guys, particularly, you know, Martirelli, he's like, look, I'm going to, this is, I'm going to fail. Um, we talked to Tom Crosgrove earlier. Um, and he was actually our first live stream. And he talked more about not having pitches that played in double a, are not having stuff that worked in in Fort Wayne and pitching and playing with guys that had better stuff um, than he did, and but the personality, the drive, the uh, the 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 ability to be adjustable and make adjustments uh, to get better really uh, really shine through for all those guys. Yeah, just to follow up on that, Tom definitely one of uh, favorite success stories through Fort Wayne and. Um... And I grew up, I grew up uh, not too far away from where he grew up out on the East coast. So came in maybe a little bit of bias, but uh, no, <laughs> he, uh, that 2018 season when he was here in Fort Wayne, if you think back, he was in a rotation with the likes of uh, Mackenzie Gore and Luis Patino. And then at the time, even guys who were drafted uh, a bit ahead of him and Nick Margavichis and Aaron Lasher and Mason Thompson was on that staff. Osvaldo Hernandez, who didn't quite pan out. He was the left-handed pitcher of the year in the league. So there were a couple of times where, yeah, Tom was fighting just to have a, a rotation right. spot, let alone <laughs> now be a guy who obviously we're counting on uh, in the big league bullpen um, who can sh- sh- strike out uh, Otani with just disgusting stuff. And uh, I know with him specifically, you know, credit to the, to the coaching staff and then his buy-in to, uh, to change his arm angle, go, uh, go down lower. But um yeah, like you said, I, I, I've been with the, uh, the tin caps here now for about a decade. And so I don't have a great, uh, background of working in multiple other organizations to be able to, uh, to compare it. I'm you know, only, uh, I'm limited in my, my knowledge of how it's like, uh, in other franchises, but yeah, I think, you know, even though it's a, team based out of San Diego here, obviously the scouts uh, all over. I mean, we're seeing now even the international scouting, not only out of Latin America, but out of the, uh, the Pacific Rim too. Um, just the ability to, uh, to find these diamonds in the rough. And like you said, I think there's something to be said for some of these guys who have a little bit of an edge or a little bit of toughness in a good way, uh, whether it's because they were going through cold weather growing up or coming out of uh, mid-major or, you know, it's non non power uh, college programs, um, what have you, 
yeah, it's, there's a drive that's hard to measure that. That is something that, um, yeah, you don't really have like an analytical, uh, stat for yet in terms of a guy's drive, a guy you touched on a coachability, all that, all those intangibles. And, uh, yeah, thankfully here in the Padres farm system, a uh, bunch of guys checking those boxes. Yeah. Well, so when I think back to my trip out to Lake Elsinore, I got to meet Lee Solomon while I was out there and he was Fort somebody Wayne. who, yeah, out, out in Fort Wayne. Yeah. So Lee Solomon, he was second base utility, did everything, but you talked to the guy and he was such a, such a bright guy and making sacrifices on the field, doing whatever it took for the team to be successful, not necessarily for his own betterment, but for everybody. Um, is there anybody on this year's team that you can think of that kind of fit that kind of a role or had that kind of a leadership outside of the the stars that we've been highlighting? Yeah, and no, I'll stall here for a second by just uh, saying, yeah, Lee, I don't know if you've kept up with him. Uh, oh, he, yeah. He retired um, a couple years ago, but at this point now, maybe a little bit more than a couple years ago because I believe he's got his law degree now. Yep. And uh, yeah, he just passed the bar this year. Yeah, yeah and I uh, he's on the radar he's going to be super successful no matter what he does but i know ken rosenthal i want to say it was ken had uh posted about uh about lee at some point in the last couple years um as a a kind of name to know in in baseball off the field going forward um shoot well here we're talking late january i guess we're three, four months removed from the season. So I'm a little reluctant to, uh, well, so, so yeah, I've got, <laughs> I've got, I've got numbers up in front of me and I can see that, uh, Lucas Dunn played pretty much everywhere on the field. Yeah. Uh, Marcos Castagnon, I think he rung the bell pretty much every single game for you, for you guys this season. Uh, those are a couple of the guys on the, yeah, you know on the position actually, player uh, side. Yeah. And actually just, uh, and I, I truly do, uh, appreciate everybody. And so I, I don't want to just call out a couple of guys here right. and leave some others, but at the end of the season, first time ever, the, the 10 caps and the Padres did this in this past year, the end of the year, we uh, honored a couple of guys who just went above and beyond when it came to their community service here during the season in Fort Wayne. And it was pretty yeah. awesome. Uh, the Padres and the 10 caps actually chipped in financially to donate, um, to charities of their choice. And so we're talking about Colton Bender, who on the depth chart was probably the number three catcher for uh, the bulk of the season. But his value, you want to talk about being uh, a leader, tr- truly kind of was the uh, the heart of the team in a lot of ways. And then not to mention, <laughs> he sat an uncanny ability for producing as well. No, I was tr- tracking the stat of like the team's winning percentage when he was in the lineup. Um, and then Keegan Collette, uh, relief pitcher, might have the best uh, curveball. <laughs> His curveball is up there. is one of the best in the entire organization. And um, another guy who uh, was a, a great leader uh, as, a, as a guy in the clubhouse uh, to go along with, uh, with his production uh, on the mound too. But, um, you know, those guys really earned uh, the recognition there uh, in terms of their uh, community service. So Absolutely. you guys get a lot of family running through there. You you mentioned the Merrill family. I guess it sounds like they were pretty frequent visitors to, uh, to Parkview Field. Um, which player had the biggest cheering section? <laughs> hmm. Uh, well, you guys also you mentioned Lucas Dunn and uh, for Lucas about a season and a half here with the Tin Caps. Um, I I, don't, I can't say necessarily he had the the biggest cheering section, although. Uh, you know, a, a guy with nice flowing blonde locks. I'm sure there was probably uh, fans of all different uh, demographics who were <laughs> pulling, pulling for Lucas. But <laughs> I'll say we have we have one uh, fan. His mom's a season ticket holder who brings him out almost every single home game. Uh, little Benny, we we call him Tiny Tin Cap. He's usually in uniform in the stands, and that means if we're wearing our red jerseys, he's got his red jersey on. If we're wearing our Padres alternate brown and gold, he's wearing that. He's locked into what the uh, what wow. the guys are wearing. Yeah, he's one of those, like sometimes you see in the background on big league broadcasts, you know, a kid who's like mimicking the umpire right. on every pitch. He's right. the type of kid who's doing that in the stands. And uh, I think Lucas became his favorite player. And, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, here, even into the off season, I understand 
Uh, this is this is pretty cool, and this uh, really sums up just the uh, the awesomeness, the beauty of minor league baseball. But uh, Lucas has developed a, a pen pal uh, rapport with uh, with Benny here in Fort Wayne as uh-huh. Lucas is off season uh, in Florida training, and uh, yeah, again, you know. Just to uh, to talk about the type of people we you know the Padres have here in the farm system that uh, you know not only are these guys signing autographs for for fans all the time but uh, you know getting to know getting to know fans especially the young fans on a personal level I'm sure the guys out in the bullpen probably treated him to a a bunch of baseballs as well at, at various points over the course of the season but uh, yeah I think that was a cool one and. Just a little story at the end of the season. Again, team was fighting for a playoff spot. Lucas, he was he was uh, sort of the last man standing, so to speak, in terms of being there from opening day all the way through to the end because some of the other guys had been called up late or maybe there were some guys out with injury. Uh, but Lucas, just ultimate grinder uh, in the lineup. And tw- it's hard to, hard to even think back to twice in a row, back-to-back nights, he was drilled by fastballs at like – 94 one night 96 the other <laughs> night and uh not just anywhere you got hit in the batting helmet oh. uh, on both occasions it was, it was scary to see but uh then that next night and this was on the road Dayton which is like two hours 15 minutes away from Fort Wayne uh little Benny a tiny tin cap and his mom they made the road trip out there to, to support the tin caps and uh Benny had a sign I forget I wish I could remember what that sign said but it was something back in back in lucas and uh yeah just uh awesome awesome uh to have that kind of fan support here you know you how, can how old is benny i would i think benny you know and he's been a fixture for several seasons now he's he's playing little league baseball himself so he's probably up to uh like second third grade eight eight or nine or so all right, all right. he might he might be my new favorite tin cat right. now i need to i need to yeah hey he actually he <laughs> don't have to if, if you go on YouTube, I think you can actually find a feature story the local uh, ABC affiliate did on him as his tiny tin cap unofficial uh, mascot. And yeah, no, all, all of this too. Well, if someone here is on YouTube, uh, one of the cool features our team had um, digital content wise this year was actually mentioned Colton Bender and sort of the value he brought to the team. An example of that too would be he was the unofficial team barber. And uh, so there's a cool oh. segment where Colton was given Jacob Marcy uh, a cut in the clubhouse. And we uh, had them mic'd up uh, for that conversation during the haircut. And they were talking about tiny tin cap and, you know, just having that kind of over the course of a long season where, uh, yeah, these guys are wearing down, not to mention being in a lot of cases far away from family, close friends, uh, just to have that kind of familiar face or familiar voice, uh, you know, cheering for them, regardless of whether or not the team's winning or losing, um, having a good week, having a bad week. Uh, he, you know, fans like him and his, and his mother for that matter, uh, always there for the guys. And, you know, that's, that's really cool. Well, you know, one of the things with Lucas done and we'll kind of, we'll, we'll wrap it up here in a second. Um, Played for Team Germany in the World Baseball Classic Qualifier. Um, has that Thor kind of, but he has that Scandinavian kind of Thor. You put some armor on him, you're like, that's Thor. That is Thor right there. Um, I, not well, a bad not, looking guy, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, well, not to counter you on that, but I, as far as our potential Thor rankings go for any uh, MILB cosplay, I guess, I mean, Carter Lowen, yeah, I think is even more. <laughs> Thor, he has the flow. Yeah, he's got the, got the flows a little bit uh, taller. Um, and Griffin Dorshing probably enters the chat there, too. <laughs> he's his uh, own kind of superhero. Okay, so you guys are commemorating 15 years of Tin Caps baseball in Parkview Field. Um, I know you guys just rolled out your promotional schedule, but uh, can you talk about some of the promotions you guys have coming up for this? Yeah, and specific to the 15th season, stay tuned. Uh, hasn't been uh, released yet, but we'll have uh, some special jerseys and hats that uh, the, the team will be rocking for select games this season. Um, and, yeah, we're, stay tuned. You know, some, some content related to that, looking back on the top players and moments um, from Parkview Field's first 15 seasons. But then uh, aside from that, just as far as, yeah, every, every year trying to have uh, – some fresh promotions at the same time, 
roll back, run back what's been most popular, resonating with fans. So yeah, you know, Star Wars nights, uh, an annual tradition. Um, Harry Potter night has been almost like an every other year one for us. I know there was a cool Harry Potter night at Petco last year. We're, we'll have a Harry well, Potter night. You guys used to be the wizards. Right. Yes. And where, so, and yes. And, and off of that, actually, we will have a throwback uh, Fort Wayne Wizards night um, with those old jerseys and hats. Last year, believe it or not, in the 15 years of Parkview Field now, our, our 90s night with the old Wizards gear, that was the top grossing night in the history of the ballpark team store um yeah you want to talk about sort of that uh that nostalgia nostalgia, right there yeah the uh the thirst for uh for the old days because i know mike nutter who was leading the team all the way back in the in the the wizards era you know he jokes probably didn't sell that much gear back when the team was actually called the wizards (laughs) but uh now it's a it's a fan favorite night uh one new one here for for families will be a day where we'll have Bluey here from the popular show that's uh, here in the United States uh, on Disney Plus. And, is it a uh, dog? Is it Bluey? Is a Bluey is a is a is a healer dog. Yep. Okay. Uh, so Bluey and his family um, will be celebrated at a game that night. Last year we had a my my niece would be so excited about that. Yeah. Well, we're doing that because last year we had a Paw Patrol day. And it was wild to see the line to get a picture taken with the characters from Paw Patrol. And uh, yeah, kind of one of the images that's <laughs> one of the, one of the lasting images for me from last year, this applies really to all the guys, but especially seeing like Nathan Martorella, who's just this hard nosed, hard nosed dude uh, who's jacked wearing the Jersey with the Paw Patrol characters on him. Um, but uh, they were, they were, they were like a dry fit material. So they, they were comfortable. So guys, you know, didn't have an issue uh, with those whatsoever. You didn't have a Chris sale moment where somebody takes the scissors and (laughs) thankfully not, you know, you guys maybe have heard this from uh, others in the organization, but a couple years ago when uh, Robbie Cano had his stints with El Paso, I remember Robbie made his Chihuahua's debut and it probably would be kind of, you know, silly enough just to see him wearing a Chihuahua's jersey, but uh, his debut came on their Nickelodeon night when he was wearing the SpongeBob, and yeah. uh, sure enough, I heard, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, credit credit to Robbie. Um, he was like, oh yeah, you know, it's it's cool, it's fun. I think that's something that definitely is a generational shift. Where especially as I don't even know guys who are certain what is uh, Leo DeVries, what generation would he even be uh, considered now as a 16 year old signee? It's probably beyond Generation Z, whatever's next. Right. Now, these guys are, these guys grew up with social media. They're down with sort of the, the goofy, silly stuff, uh, having fun. So, yeah. And then, yeah, tincaps.com is the full list of promotions because yeah. we spent another hour talking about those. But we'll have, uh, and here, I guess, talking with you guys, hopefully, you know, won't get in trouble with lawyers, but we'll have, one night that's pretty much an ode to uh, the Bachelor franchise because the Golden Bachelor uh, actually is uh, from the Fort Wayne area. And uh, oh. I don't know if we'll have a special guest that night, potentially. Okay. Um, we're Maybe have, a wedding. Uh, Could have a wedding. We don't know. I don't know. How's that work? <laughs> well, that one already <laughs> ends. So Maybe we'll have a different someone else's wedding. We'll see. There actually is something to that. Stay tuned. And um, we'll have a night here. Actually, Taylor Swift, 15 years ago, uh, Taylor Swift is coming to Fort Wayne. Woo! She came to Fort Wayne 15 years ago in June. And so we're actually playing a game on the anniversary of that concert. So, um, you know, something, something to that for, uh, for Swifties out there. Yeah. Pretty much something for everyone. Uh, again, some of the popular ones we have like the tenderloins, our Manzanas, Luchadoras, Hispanic heritage. Yeah. Series. We'll have uh, our Fort Wayne Daisies throwback to the all American girls professional baseball league team. Yeah. It's just uh, Morgan Olson, uh, our assistant director of, uh, of marketing and promotions along with the rest of the crew. Um, Emma race and the team story. They've got some, some really great stuff uh, coming up this year. You, well, John, as usual, you come and you kill it and we have a blast and it's fun. And we can keep talking here for, for another half an hour, 45 minutes. At but least. We know, we know you, you went to the ballpark to do this for us. So um, we're going to let you go. We thank you so much. Get home, 
Um, thank you so much. And we can't wait to, you know, promote all this content in the next coming season. Yeah. Whether it's uh flooding or, uh, ice and snow, <laughs> everyone out there stay safe, uh, until we get to baseball season, hopefully better forecast then. But uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me on here. Truly appreciate all the coverage that you provide, not just of the prospects, but you know, you guys do such a great job of telling the story of minor league baseball and, capturing really the essence of uh of minor league baseball players and beyond that even uh the franchises too like we have here in fort wayne so appreciate you you know roy now you're kind of overdue for uh, a visit donovan i, I are, know point, <laughs> I'm, I'm reluctant to say it but you are kind of slacking it's really the only area in which you're not excelling um I, with uh, friars on the farm there is a there is a plan in place in the in the future in the future i i may be in the area i may be in the region in the coming years um uh looking at at uh north e northwest uh north carolina so i won't be too far away I'll be able to drive there for a long weekend, but uh, certainly well, I I will some I will make it in the next in the next several years. I will um, definitely try to grace uh, you with my presence. You Sooner <laughs> rather than later, man. You've got to get out. I keep telling Donovan, you gotta you know, go. It's yeah, such I, a great park. It's so cool. In the next fifteen years, you you better. <laughs> and um, I'll wait there for the thirtieth. <laughs> yeah, no, no, got to be sooner than that. But uh, yeah, thanks again for. For having me on, and yeah, maybe next time we'll have to make it like a two-parter. So, um, so we're, I'm not rambling here too too long for just one episode. Well, we appreciate you calling in and taking the time. Thank you so much. Yep. Thanks uh, finally to you guys and for everyone out there tuned in and who follows uh, the, the Padres farm system. Uh, yeah. Thanks for uh, thanks for uh, whether your your eyes, your ears, uh, your dollars, maybe even uh, appreciate you. Can do.